Hey everyone, my name is Rajesh Nishtala, and I've been a software engineer at Meta for the past 14 years. Prior to that, I did my grad school in high performance computing. I have been lucky enough to witness how we've scaled our infrastructure through the years and how high performance computing went from niche to mainstream through AI. Today, AI is used in a wide variety of products and services around the world. And I'm going to be talking to you today about how we've scaled our infrastructure to support AI and what are the lessons that we have learned. The 2010s saw a dramatic rise in the number of people using the internet, as well as the number of people using social media. For example, the internet went from about 2 billion users to more than 4 billion users during the decade. Social media went from about 1 billion to more than 3 billion users using it during the same time. And also the engagement increased significantly. With this increased growth on the platforms, more and more people were coming online and posting content with their phones and reaching audiences that they never dreamed of before. There's an explosion in the amount of content that was available through and the amount of people that they could reach. Now, everyone has nearly an infinite amount of content that they can engage with. So instead of just adding users to the platform, we have to increasingly figure out how to connect users to the content that they care about. Thus, the rise of recommendation ranking led to a dramatic growth of AI. Today, we rely on AI for a wide variety of things, such as understanding our content to make sure that we protect our platforms, of course, ranking and recommendations, leveraging AI to break down the language barrier through machine translations, and now generative AI to help us understand, synthesize, and all of this information together and help us create new content. Today, AI is used in a wide variety of products and services and many other companies around the world. It continues to be a central part of how we of our products. So thus, with billions of people around the world using and producing content, AI takes a central role. And we as infrastructure teams have to figure out how to support all of this for all the products that everyone is building. So we have built infrastructure to support the various stages of the AI lifecycle, all the way from consuming data, to training models, to optimizing those models, and then finally serving them out to production. Our organization supports all of these functions, including the PyTorch ecosystem as well. However, the journey to get to where we are today was filled with many lessons, which I'll walk you through a sampling of them today. I'll break up these lessons into three different categories, such as one, how we scaled our compute, two, how we made, develop, train, and serve these models through better developer experiences, and three, how we manage our data better. First, scaling our compute. Back in 2019, our systems were designed to serve products that reached billions of users, and they were heavily CPU-based. We were very reliable and resilient to individual nodes failing or even data centers being knocked offline. And they worked really well. We had a largely homogenous server fleet that we were very smooth in operating and maintaining and scaling through the years. However, as AI started to conclude, we didn't really have the notion of multiple CPUs working in concert on a single coordinated workload. The closest thing that we had was our large MapReduce jobs, but the latency, throughput, coordination, communication requirements were very different. In addition, trying to train models on CPUs was just hitting a performance plateau. We had to switch them to GPUs. So while our infrastructure was heavily optimized for, for distributed system one type of workload, we had to take a lot of pains to transfer that to make it work for AI. It was like fitting a square peg into a round hole. On the other side, high performance computing had been largely in the realm of scientific computing, such as understanding how our climate is working. With the rise of AI, a lot of the techniques that were in the scientific computing and high performance computing industries were needed to make AI scale. So thus, we were in this interesting predicament. On one side, you have high performance computing applications that are very targeted, very niche, domain specific environments. And on the other side, you have these distributed systems that are responsible for serving products across billions of users around the world that had to be highly resilient. And we had to bring these worlds together. And that was a big challenge for us in AI infrastructure. How do we do that? What are the, how do we build infrastructure that can serve the needs of AI? while withstanding the failures that we see in a production environment. Once we made progress towards scaling AI and bringing these worlds together, we were able to run jobs at in hundreds or maybe low thousands of GPUs. Then Gen AI came. And where we needed to run larger and larger models, of tens of thousands of GPUs needed to work together in unison. Thus, in addition to all the advancement we faced above, we faced a new set of challenges to scale these models. 
we had to figure out how to minimize the cost of failures because whenever a single node got knocked offline, the entire job had to come to a halt and then we, we restarted. So we had to minimize the cost of failures, build better tools to find and debug problems when they happen, better checkpoints. So if we can frequently, frequently re- the checkpoint state so we reduce waste of time and make job, restarting jobs faster. This is just a sampling of the stuff that we're working on, but this is just, there's a lot more work that we're working on in this space. In the early days of Facebook, we realized that it was really important for us to optimize the entire hardware and software stack together. We went all the way from the physical data center buildings and layouts themselves, all the way through the hardware network to make sure that the entire end-to-end stack was optimized and they were able to scale. Our efforts around open compute were very successful and critical to how we scaled our infra through the years. As we switched to AI, a big missing piece of that end-to-end optimization strategy was the lack of the GPUs. So we have embarked on an ambitious journey to develop and deploy our own silicon to better optimize the entire stack together. As we continue to scale our compute resources, resources and provide infrastructure optimized for AI, we have to now figure out how to make this useful and make it easier to develop, train, and serve models. In 2019, most of the models deployed were sparse neural networks authored and run in CAFE2 using asynchronous training. PyTorch started to establish itself as a de facto industry language for AI, but our production models weren't using it. So in 2019, we made a concerted effort to port all our models over to PyTorch so that we could better leverage the advancements of the industry and make sure that we could leverage the GPUs to train larger and larger models. At the time, our focus was making sure that we could develop these models as efficiently as possible and make sure our developers could iterate as fast as possible to continue to leverage the gains of AI in our products. This meant that we highly optimized the entire stack all the way from the model authoring through the running the entire thing. And we, the company saw a lot of amazing gains from it. However, in late 2022, 2023, we started to realize that sparse neural networks were not the only modeling paradigm. A shift was coming that a new type of modeling architecture started to emerge that were critical to our success, such as the transformers and Gen AI. We had thus optimized infrastructure for one specific class of models that made development of this new other class of models cumbersome. And so we had to quickly backtrack and be able to make our infrastructure more flexible than it was. We had overfit our infrastructure to one type of model architecture. Interestingly enough, when it comes to serving our models through inference, we had the opposite problem. On that side, different teams had built bespoke solutions that were targeted for their specific niche use cases. And we didn't have a centralized way to upgrade. We didn't have a centralized way to kind of coordinate all of this together. So we embarked on a journey to create an inference platform so that everybody could work to have a similar experience. So thus, on one side, we had a monolithic stack designed to train and serve that didn't serve us well that we had to figure out what to do with. And on the other side, we had a large collection of bespoke services that we had to figure out how to centralize. And eventually, both of them led to the similar point in the middle, which was a componentized architecture. The idea being that we would build a layered stack, provide building blocks that our application teams could then use to build the solutions and training platforms and imprint solutions that they needed in order to serve their models at scale. Today, our building blocks are based on PyTorch, with then says serve meta back, using meta backends where applicable. Data and AI are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Much has been said about how we manage data for AI and other, other data at scale talks, so I encourage you to watch those talks as well. Today, we'll be focusing on how we read the data for AI. When it comes to reading data, there's two classes of reading data. First, if thinking about ranking and recommendation, we have to be able to ingest all the activity that's happening on the site and understand it and like make recommendations based on that. Given the scale of these ecosystems, we're talking about tens of terabytes a second that our ingestion systems have to understand and consume. On the other side, for training large, large foundational models for Gen AI, we have to read very large static corpuses of data where the data itself where the training itself dictates 
what data sets to pull next. We had originally thought that these were very similar types of problems, but we quickly realized that they were not. They're actually very different problems and different challenges. And now we realize that we have to treat them as different entities. One of the powers of social media is to make our products feel reactive, that they're listening to you, that they're reacting to how you're, moving, you're using the platform, your current mood. So in addition to all the large scale infrastructure that we had to build to train these large models, we had to build infrastructure to make our products feel more reactive and drive our modeling changes to help that. So these systems would log the events and log the activity that you're doing, update the models based on what you're working on, and then push them out so that the next generation of content can get updated. And all of this has to be done in the order of minutes, if not faster. While we have come a long way in our infrastructure, we still have a long way to go. The rise of large foundational models is pushing us, pushing the boundaries of how we scale these models, how we use these models, and, and how, most importantly, how we enhance our products through the power of AI. Of course, with the rise of AI, we have to think about the ramifications of accuracy and making sure that as we grow the ecosystem, we have to do it in a responsible way. While there's a lot of promise around what AI could deliver, the reality is that we're still very far from that. There are a lot of open questions to answer, a lot of challenges to solve, and above all else, for this community, how do we actually take the power of AI and deliver it through world-class products, which I'm very excited to hear about today. As Mark recently announced, we're having ambitious plans to support 600,000 GPUs in our fleet. AI is going to continue to grow at a tremendous pace, and we view our role in AI infra to be able to support this rapid scale of innovation and most importantly, make sure our products are successful and we deliver the power of AI to billions of people around the world. We're really looking forward to the next set of challenges ahead of us. And our job is just 1% finished. Thank you.